The US Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade has reverberated around the world. This is a rich, modern, developed country which has taken a massive step back on what most of us see as a fundamental right. How could that happen? Yet while that might be the common response here in the UK, not everyone agrees. This was Tory MP Danny Kruger speaking in a debate on the decision. Mr Speaker, I recognise uh, the degree of distress and concern felt by many members in the House uh, on the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, and the fact is I probably disagree with most members who've spoken so far about this question. They think that, uh, that women have an absolute right of bodily autonomy in this matter, whereas I think in the, yes. case, in the case of abortion, that right is qualified by the fact that another body is involved. But we can disagree on that question. That is the, pur that is the purpose. We disagree on that question. And I offer to members who are trying to talk me down that this is a proper topic for political debate. And my point to the front bench is, I don't understand why we are lecturing the United States on a, on a judgment to return the power of decision over this political question to the states, to, for, to democratic decision makers, rather than leaving it in the hands of the courts. That was Tory MP Danny Kruger saying that women don't have an absolute right to bodily autonomy. It's caused a lot of outrage, which is entirely justified. Kruger fundamentally misconstrues what has happened in the United States. The Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade wasn't the result of a good faith debate about whether abortion should be left to elected politicians or to judges. It was the climax of a decades-long campaign by Christian fundamentalists to fundamentally limit the rights of women. And of course, contrary to what Kruger suggested, the court's decision has definitively not provoked a sensitive debate about the respective rights of women and unborn fetuses. Rather, it's led to a wave of automatic state bans on abortion in any and every circumstance. This map shows just how widespread the effects of the decision will be, with abortions either banned or likely to be banned in around half the states of the US. Moya, that comment has caused a lot of outrage. I think it's been viewed more than three million times on, on Twitter. What did you make of it? Is the outrage justified? Oh, I mean, of course the outrage is justified. I think that any um, elected representative who wants to undermine the right that women have to bodily autonomy, especially via abortion, there should obviously be outrage. We should be scared about that. Um, it was interesting that you said that Krug had misconstrued what happened in the US because I don't know if he is, has. I think that he, obviously what he's trying to present it as is like this good natured debate, as you said. But that is what anti-abortion activists do see this as. They think uh, abortion shouldn't exist. They think that fetal rights should be prevail over, in most cases, the rights of the person carrying the fetus. They think that abortion is murder. And they might want to present it in sort of like, oh, we should have this debate, they should have this debate, we should do this, we should do that. But underneath it all, they want abortion outlawed. What's really interesting is when you look at the US, the campaign to unpick abortion rights has been going on since abortion rights were um, passed as federal law. So since the 1970s, there has been a concerted and organized effort to unpick these rights and they use an incremental approach. And it's really demoralizing, obviously, to see the fruits of this, but it's also a complete roadmap for organizing. And several anti-abortion campaigners, some of the most dogged ones, there's some interesting interviews with them on um, podcasts like Vox Explained, talked about how the roadmaps they used were things like the NACCP and Plessy versus Ferguson. So massive civil rights pro progress. Um, they used the same sort of organizing and coalition and strategy, incremental strategy, in order to slowly sort of put these cases forward to the Supreme Court, to test the Supreme Court, how far they go, how willing they were to sort of rehear the case for rolling back federal abortion rights and this constitutional right to, an ab to get an abortion. And that's that is protected under what they call an enumerated right, which means it's not actually expressly um, articulated in the constitution as a right in itself, but comes under, say, the right to privacy. And other things that aren't expressly um, you know, protected in the constitution are things like the right to vote. You know, we talk about Kruger being like, oh, you know, he wants this debate. He doesn't want a debate. He clearly is not in favor of abortion. And what we're also seeing that we should be really wary of in the UK is the evangelical American Christian right, as you talked about. They are 
they are linking up internationally with people over here, particularly within the transphobic movement. So a lot of sort of legal cases and legal challenges are following the same pattern that unpicked Roe versus Wade in the UK. They're making these concerted legal challenges in order to unpick the rights that already exist for trans people. They're also at the same time attacking the things that protect stuff like access to contraception, contraception for everyone. And they want to attack things like anti-abortion. If you look at a lot of the funding that's going behind these legal challenges and the alliances that high profile anti-trans you know, figures and activists have in the UK, they are often with people from the Christian evangelical right in the US who come with a lot of money, a lot of experience and a lot of know-how of this incremental strategy. And we need to be aware of that because an attack on bodily autonomy across women, cis or trans, is, you know, it's an attack on any sort of rights that protect those rights to choose, that right to contraception, that right to simply exist in your body and have a say over it. I suppose to defend um, my, my statement that what he said misconstrues what's going on in the United States, is it's kind of a response to a number of people who I've, I've seen on Twitter who have said, this is basically faux outrage, because what he said isn't actually an extreme position, because he said women don't have an absolute right to bodily autonomy. And we're going to talk about sort of UK law in, in specifically in a moment and sort of its limitations. But it is the case that I don't think in any country in the world, um, you know, abortion at any term, at any phase of sort of the fetal development is 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 legal and fine without there being, you know, any sort of exceptional circumstances. So people have said, why are people getting outraged? What he said is actually most people's position that women don't have absolute right to bodily autonomy because at a certain point, the unborn baby begins to have some rights. So they've said, well, why are people getting so outraged at this? He hasn't said anything extreme. And I think there's something to that. I don't think that's an unreasonable point, but I think what they miss is that he is misconstruing the debate in the United States because this isn't about the Supreme Court saying, oh no, there isn't just an absolute right to bodily autonomy for women because you know there wasn't any way, right? There already were things like term limits in the United States. This is a Supreme Court making a decision which they know um, and, you know, they seem to be making this for political reasons. They know will lead to the instant sort of outlawing of abortion in all circumstances in a number of states. So while he's saying, you know, these rights aren't absolute, there's a genuine debate to be had here. That's not what this is about in the United States. This is about banning abortion in all circumstances and not just saying the right to bodily autonomy of a pregnant person is limited, but to say they have none whatsoever in no circumstance whatsoever. So that, I suppose that's where I was um, um, coming from with that point. Um, I do want to talk a bit about UK law, um, because sometimes the way we talk about abortion in this country can seem a little complacent if we think everything is, is fine and dandy here. Great Britain, the United Kingdom, is far from a country where women are entitled to a large degree of bodily autonomy compared to other countries in the world. Women here are not entitled to on-demand abortions, rather they can get an abortion in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy only if they have the consent of two doctors who must declare the risk of pregnancy to the person's mental or physical health is greater than the risk posed by an abortion. And abortions can be carried out later than 24 weeks only in extreme circumstances such as when there is a risk to the pregnant person's life or when the fetus has a severe disability. In all other cases, abortion is illegal. So a woman's right to bodily autonomy in the UK is, is very much not absolute and indeed very far from it. Particularly that need to get sign off from two doctors is pretty out of step with most of the developed world. More extreme than that, an issue often overlooked in discussions in Britain is the status of abortions in Northern Ireland. Right up until 2019, women in Northern Ireland had no right to an abortion unless their life was at risk. That was changed when an amendment put forward by Stella Creasy was passed in the UK Parliament. But even now, abortions are only legal up to 12 weeks and combined with a lack of provision, it has the consequence that 161 women from Northern Ireland travel to Great Britain to access abortions in 2021 alone. So that is not a situation that Britain should be proud of. Finally, when it comes to opposition to abortion rights on the Tory benches, Danny Kruger is far from alone. In 2011, current Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, Nadine Dorries, tried to pass an amendment which would have reduced the time limit on abortion from 24 to 20 weeks. It was defeated, thankfully. And in a 2017 Good Morning Britain interview, current Minister for Brexit Opportunities, Jacob Rees-Mogg, said this. 
I'm completely opposed to abortion. Life begins at the point of so conception. So why, un- why are you prepared to say you're opposed to abortion, but, not opposed to because the, the same-sex marriage? Then? But because it's a completely different um, kettle of fish. That with, it's a Catholic teaching. No, 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 hold on. It's a different kettle of fish. That with um, same-sex marriage, mm. that is something that people are doing for themselves. With abortion, it is something that is done to the unborn child. Are you completely opposed to abortion in all circumstances? Um, yes, I am. Rape and incest? Sexual violence? I'm afraid so. Really? Life, life is sacrosanct and begins at the point of conception. And I think it is so wrong. So if a woman is raped, and say you were prime minister, and a woman is raped by a family member, the, right? You would say she had absolutely no right to no, I, have that baby aborted. No, she would have a right under UK law. Yeah, but would, you wouldn't agree with that, right? But that law is not going to change. No, but what's your personal opinion? My personal opinion is that life begins at the point of conception and abortion is morally indefensible. You would- then in 2019, when Parliament voted to decriminalise some abortions in Northern Ireland, 99 mostly Tory MPs voted against the change. These included current ministers Dominic Raab, Therese Coffey, Suella Braverman, Simon Clark, Michelle Donnellan, George Eustace and, of course, Jacob Rees-Mogg. So to be clear, for them, it was a matter of conscience not to extend to Northern Irish women the rights of their British counterparts. More recently, other Tories have been less shy about stating their more extreme views. Peter Bone voted in favour of Dorries' 2011 amendment. Here he is speaking on LBC. Pro-choice is a woman has a right to decide. Pro-life, people who support that, you and I tend to be in that category, think that the baby at conception is is a human being and has a right to life. And and therefore, I'm very surprised that the BBC is changing that because everyone talks about pro-life and pro-choice, don't they? Are you surprised? Not sure I am. Well, I... I, (laughs) Okay. Disappointed. Oh. I mean, in this country, we've always debated this uh, and we've always had a free vote on it. And I think that's the right way. I think, was it Lord Steele that brought in the... Had, has, has regretted what has happened over the years and the number of abortions. So there are arguments to be had. And, and I I do say that, that there is a point where there is a baby. And I don't think you there is the argument that baby has a right to life. And... That argument, you may say it's Christian, but it's I think it's I as a Christian, I think that's a perfectly fair thing. But in this country, we've as you rightly say, in we've sort of I won't say compromise, but we've come to agreement what, when does life we, start? We, and and we, that's that's we've that's, been pragmatic, haven't we? Yeah. Um, and and yes, because medical science is better, babies survive at an earlier age, we've moved the weeks. And I think that's I think most people still okay. support that. I mean, I should be clear. I, I think people should have any right to have whatever position they want on abortion. I'm actually perfectly fine with, say, Catholic MPs, you know, out of conscience, saying they personally are morally against abortion. That's fine. People are entitled to their beliefs. I think if you vote to limit abortion for other people, that becomes despicable, right? I think it's very, very different to say, my religion says I shouldn't do this and I, you know, I'm against this. I think, you know, potentially abstaining on votes when it comes to abortion, because you can say, look, it's, it's very difficult for me to engage in this because of my religion. I think abstaining could be perfectly legitimate. Voting against other people's rights to have an abortion, I think is, is despicable, whatever your religious background. I think there's one major thing here which impacts sort of abortion access, and it's even more pressing than sort of Danny Kruger or Tory MPs who are opposed to abortion at the moment, which is that our healthcare system is in crisis. So the abortion provisions we have are not actually working in the way they should. There was a report that came out last year which looked at the sort of backlog with women having to weigh up wait after they've been referred to abortion for at least 10 weeks because of these backlogs in this like in um reproductive care and in places like Scotland and Northern Ireland there are even more barriers to abortion there was a recent article by Rachel Connolly talking about the physical and ge- like the geographic barriers that face women seeking abortion in Scotland because no health board in Scotland actually provides abortion care up to the legal limit of 24 weeks, which means that since 2019, at least at least 100, I think, 70 women have had to travel down to England in order to access an abortion that they should be able to get in you know, their local neighbourhood. And with Northern Ireland is a really interesting one and a really worrying thing because Northern Ireland is the only country where technically abortion is fully decriminalised because it was decriminalised in, you know, in 2019. But 
the provisions to provide abortion have not yet been implemented by the Northern Irish administration because the health minister has refused to commission services. So you've got this bizarre setup where technically abortion is fully fully legal in a way that it actually isn't in the UK. And we talked about, you know, it's not fully decriminalised in England and Wales and Scotland under the Abortion Act, but in Northern Ireland it is. And yet pregnant people cannot still not access um, the abortion that they need and the care as well. Traveling thousands of miles, it takes, you know, money, it takes, you know, having a passport. People who are, you know, in low income jobs, who have to sort out childcare, who don't have someone to support them, all those things are barriers. One positive thing that did happen at the start of this year was that um, in England and Wales, then um, telemedicine and at, at early at home abortions were made legal, but that's only up to a certain amount of weeks. And there has been a real uptick in you know the stay at home abortion care and the ability of access because of that but that's something that happened really recently and it's positive but now with this sort of precedent that we're seeing in places like America the question is open again it is never fully settled what is positive is in some places like Latin America which have up until recently had some of the most restrictive abortion legislation in the world we're now seeing the fruits of their organizing where you have you know countries like i think it is um Argentina and Colombia as well have made abortion and have taken the steps to make it fully legal and decriminalized it. So abortion access in Latin America is actually opening up as abortion access in the US is shutting down. All of us here at Navarra Media are working harder than ever to keep scrutinizing establishment politicians and the media barons who protect them. We don't have billionaire funders. We don't have advertising partnerships. We're funded entirely by you. If you've ever thought about supporting us, now's the time to go to navaramedia.com slash support and donate anything you can from just one pound per month. Defy the corporate media, join our monthly supporters and help build our supporter base to 10,000 strong. 